This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Edward Lee. He is a professor of law. The topic of conversation is something that I think just about everybody on the damn planet is going to have to reckon with at some point in the future, because ultimately, we are all creators. Let's face it, the internet attempts to, and does a very good job in many instances, of monetizing us. That's right. We are the fuel. We are the blood for all of these big social media companies. Without us, they're not worth $100 billion. We are the creators. We make the content. That's the flat out truth. With Edward's new book, Creators Take Control, he goes down the path of where artistic expression and trademark meet. And he sees, and I've brought this up on this podcast before, he sees NFTs and the blockchain as ultimately the place where we take some control. Now, look, even if you think this is not relevant to you, well, that's your mistake. But it's probably going to be relevant to your friends, your family, your kids. doesn't make a difference. We are the money. Without the blood, without the people, nothing happens. And when we create something, whether it's a blog post, a piece of music, a book, a trading system, we should be able to protect our rights and get compensated, just as the big publishers will use their army of attorneys to protect the copyrights of certain books or certain pieces of music, as we all know happens, for example, on YouTube. You put the wrong piece of music up on YouTube, you get a strike. But my voice, why can't my voice, if it's produced, and there's a lot of time and energy put into it for a particular production, I deserve the same protections. Without any more setup from me, let's jump right into a wide open conversation with the good professor, where art meets law, and where hopefully us creators take control. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Edward Lee. In thinking of this conversation, I'm a guy with eight books, a thousand plus podcast episodes. I once directed a documentary film. I have thousands of blog post entries over the years. There's no doubt, especially when I look at something like YouTube and how YouTube helps creators with ad dollars, at least when YouTube wants to, that there's probably been a lot of money left on the sidelines for me over the years. And when I also think about how it's been to work with publishers, I think I've had four different publishers. They've all been good and bad in their own ways. But NFTs, even though I've just got a little bit of a taste of what they are, we're going to go into it today. This is something that will revolutionize my life. It'll change my life completely. Coming at it from your perspective, let's just pick, for example, a book. I want to have my next book come out. Okay, I can work with a publisher. There's all kinds of ways that the rights leave my control. They handle distribution. Or I can go and do a self-published book. Map out a scenario for people that are unfamiliar with NFTs, how my book life would change with an NFT. I think the possibilities are limitless. There are various ways in which you can basically enlist members of the public or members within your social media circle to serve as your patrons and also potentially collaborators through NFTs. So that the way that the NFTs have been used so far is in part to help artists raise funding, whether it be musicians or filmmakers or visual artists. We've actually seen fewer cases so far of book authors, but that may be something on the horizon. But it's all just a digital product at the end of the day. Whether it's music, whether it's a book, it's just a digital product. And if it's a digital product 
and it's got IP to it, if it's got intellectual property to it, and it can be sold, then NFTs are applicable, yes? Yes, exactly. And I think one of the key innovations is it establishes a form of virtual ownership for the digital content. For years, especially visual artists, found a hard time trying to sell their works because they face the question, well, where is the original work when it could be infinitely copied, the digital copies? And what an NFT does is establish a unique token that makes a work potentially original. There is one version associated with the NFT. Let me take a step back though, just so people can understand this. Everyone can imagine going into an art gallery, there's a physical painting on the wall. I guess it could stay on the wall in the museum, but the ownership could be ultimately redone through an NFT in the future. Yes, potentially. Many in the traditional art world, when they first heard about NFTs, were thinking about doing exactly that, establishing provenance of a physical artwork and using that as the certificate of authentication for the physical artwork. I think what we are on the cusp of seeing is the growth of digital art in the traditional art world. Saint Pompidou, LACMA, MoMA, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, all have already entered the NFT world with digital artworks. We're just at the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. We're going to see a lot more of this in the future so that that increases the pool of artists now that the leading art institutions are considering their works. Also, I think spur more digital creators to consider this as a full-time path or occupation. Let me take a step back. I think we really need to define the nitty gritty of what we're talking about. Again, I just described what I do. Somebody else might do a painting. Somebody else might write computer code. Right now, if you write code, okay, I could write code. I could sell that code myself. I could sell it to a big enterprise. Maybe I work for Microsoft and Microsoft already owns the code that I create. There's a whole system for this now. There's a system for selling books. There's a system for selling music. Explain really at a base level, because it's not necessarily about a picture in a museum or a podcast or anything, but explain at a base level how an NFT is disrupting the current system of ownership, intellectual property, et cetera. I think people really need to wrap their arms around that in a jargon-free way to understand how this is disrupting. I think at a very basic level, there is a token that is being created through a computer program. And that is establishing the ownership over whatever the subject matter is, whether it's an artwork or it could be a physical house. Anything that you can imagine can be owned, can be tokenized with an NFT that therefore makes it easy to engage in transactions because it's all recorded on blockchain. And I know I've thrown in a few technical terms. I think even at the beginning, a lot of people, I would guess, honestly, 90% plus of the audience, and I've got a pretty astute audience, but they're probably saying, hold on, let's don't get past the word token first. A token is a virtual token. It is actually a metaphor for just unique lines of code in a computer program called a smart contract. So what has developed for NFTs is using a computer program to create a unique identifier for some other subject matter, such as let's go back to the artwork category. So now I've written my computer program and it has some unique lines of code. And I will there, in addition to the unique lines of code, I will refer to whatever that property that I wanted to refer to, such as a file containing the digital artwork. 
So through that arrangement, I have now created this virtual ownership by writing unique lines of code that are recorded on blockchain. So that is the more technical side of how it is created. In a layperson sense, the one easy way to think about it, it has often been likened to a virtual twin of whatever the underlying asset or property that you have designated. To go back to your original example of an artwork and a physical artwork, now I'm going to create this computer program and I'm going to designate that it is for the physical painting. And what it is doing is creating this virtual twin of the physical painting. And that is recorded on blockchain. Now, I think the more common uses today deal with what you described before, digital content, NFTs identifying digital content that faced the problem in the past where every single copy is the same. Well, when every single copy is the same, it's hard to find a market for that. But when there is one unique copy, because there is now an NFT that is associated with it, that's where we've seen a market for digital art has blossomed. As the layperson, you describe it, computer program lines of code, and we're creating a token. Well, if I'm the budding hacker in Belarus, I'm saying to myself, well, let's go to the computer and start hacking. Let's start ripping this apart. Let's start attacking every bit of the source of this, because this potentially unlocks all of these protected pieces of digital art, books, music, et cetera. Explain to the layperson how the NFT is going to protect both the creator and the buyer without the subversive actor jumping into the middle and stealing things. One of the advantages of blockchain is that it's very hard to change the records on blockchain because it uses a consensus mechanism meaning that it's a peer-to-peer -peer network and there's redundancy in the network, meaning that many of the computers that store the records have a duplicate of all the records that are recorded on a particular blockchain. Here, let's say an Ethereum blockchain that stores records related to NFTs, many different peers on the network have the same records. So in order for the hacker to change a record, that hacker would have to change the records among all of the peers in the network. It's not impossible to do, but it's very hard to do because it requires the transaction costs and the paying of gas fees to launch such an attack. So that aspect of blockchain provides a technological defense that makes it very difficult to have a hacker come in and change the records now, I should mention the more conventional route where there is a problem, and this is not something that blockchain can prevent in its current state, there's a lot of phishing attacks through email and through social media that have resulted in stolen NFTs. This is an issue also. People have got this phishing issue for their own bank accounts, all this stuff. I'm not going to be mean here, but if people are idiots, people are idiots. And it happened. Phishing is not just only showing up in terms of NFTs going away. It's showing up for everything. It's the Nigerian prince, send us your money and we'll send you 20 million routine. This has been going on since the dot-com era. Let me get to the real big picture here, because I think this gets actually to the title of your work and what really catches me as a creator. So I can think of operations out there. And I mentioned YouTube. I can think of Substack and Patreon and Spotify, all the publishers that I've worked with in the book world. They're all middlemen. They're all middlemen who promise creators that we have the distribution. I can think of Audible. Audible essentially, and this is why Jeff Bezos is worth over $100 billion, is that when I put a book on Audible, I get 40%, Jeff gets 60. Nice deal. But this is all middlemen. Explain how you might imagine in the future that middlemen 
the people that control the levers, so to speak, how in the world could they really be happy with an NFT revolution? It feels like to me that if the NFT revolution happens, that all these middlemen are going to go down fighting and kicking and screaming because ultimately, if you're a creator and you make something, a book, a film, whatever, and you can dip your toe into the marketplace, and this might take some work. Maybe you know one person that can help you distribute. Maybe they know another person and it reaches another avenue. But it just feels like if the creator can create, has the legal protections, can launch something out into the ether, and it can start to take root, all these middlemen I just mentioned can't be happy with NFTs. I think you're exactly right. I think NFTs are disruptive. They may have greater disruption in certain industries, music, I think potentially. Already we've seen it has disrupted, I think, the art market. That's quite good. But from an imagination standpoint, anything that can be created on your computer can be monetized if there's a market for it. You don't necessarily know if there's a market for something if you create it, music, book, whatever. You don't know until you launch it into the market. But it just seems like NFTs are for anything one might create today. Truly. I think that's why I think the possibilities are limitless with NFTs. One industry that stands out to me where it might be harder to radically disrupt would be, I think, the movie industry. For big budget films, that's something that Hollywood has really perfected in terms of building franchises based on Marvel characters, let's say. But that's all they do now. That's true. In that sense, if a creator out there imagines a $30 million budget, wants to make the types of films that we might have seen 10, 20, or 30 years ago, not necessarily the 15th version of Spider-Man, it seems like NFTs might be a benefit. I'm not competing with the next Star Wars. They're going to make a million more of those, and they're all going to cost $250 million, and they're going to make their $1.5 billion. At least they hope that routine will continue. I'm just pushing back on the movie part. I can see your point. Clearly, they've got a lot of money. They make big budget films. It does strike me that it depends on where you're poking around in the film industry. Oh, entirely. In the book, I mentioned the possibility that the next Pulp Fiction independent film could be financed through NFTs. How would they do that? That's a great example. I've seen a ton of documentaries and a ton of interviews from him, Tarantino, on making Pulp Fiction, actually a bunch recently. And it's a fascinating process to listen to how he first did Reservoir Dogs, how that came to be. Reservoir Dogs led to Pulp Fiction. How might the budding filmmaker out there right now that's listening to you and say, man, I want to raise money to make the next Pulp Fiction. How would they do that? I already think we have the playbook from Miguel Faust and maybe a few others. Julie Pacino has also fundraised for their films. What's the max amount of money you've seen raised so far for a film? I'm not sure. I don't have the figure off the top of my head. I think these are relatively low budget, but it certainly has, I think, provided the example. Miguel Faust's Caladita won an award at Sundance this year. I think since we're so early, it's been a couple of years since really NFTs have taken off. We're bound to see much more creativity and development across the board in different sectors, not just film, music, and art, you name it, gaming, et cetera. I think this is all being developed right now as we speak. And ultimately, it is, from your perspective, the end around, around the middlemen that I described. Yes, it certainly provides a way for independent artists to sustain themselves financially, to make a living, not having to sign with a major studio or label book publisher to make it. And this is a decentralized process where you work potentially directly with your fans or supporters or patrons back in the day of the Renaissance. You work with your patrons to fund your creative pursuits. And I think we've seen so many successes so far in a couple of years, especially more in the visual art genre. We're going to see, I think, other successes in music and film, gaming. Back in the day, though, there would have been no chance in the Renaissance that if you had a few patrons and you created something, the chance for viral distribution did not exist. Today, 
if you're a filmmaker, if you're an author, I know several authors that have sold over 10 million plus books. I guarantee you those guys wish like hell that in its fullest development, NFTs existed because they probably would have rather have taken the chance to dip their toe into the slipstream and get that viral connection with all those audiences out there versus just trusting the publisher. I would ultimately argue your book too included. Ultimately, I don't think the publishers make a book success. It's ultimately, does the book resonate? Does the audience get on board? Does it get viral? Publishers don't control that. That's the crazy thing that creators don't necessarily understand. But I think the publishers understand it big time. Creators don't get it until you create something. Once you create it and once you're compensated for it, then you realize, oh shit, the publishers did not necessarily help me so much. Yeah, that's a great insight. It reminds me of two things. One, I think Rick Rubin says something very similar in his book, his latest book, The Creative Act. The second thing is- That book is en route to me right now. I've not seen it. Oh, it's fantastic. It's something that I turn back to, even though I finished it, I turn back to go over some of the passages. The other thing that reminds me of is Colleen Hoover's success as a book author. And the New York Times had a fabulous article about her success. And it's exactly what you said. It is based on her social media following her ability to connect with her readers who will turn to her latest book, even if it's quite different from the previous book. I think that combination, it's interesting because if you think about the combination, it is what we would call a web two social media platform combined with the new advantages of ownership with NFTs and the so-called web three, developing web three aspect where there's this ability to own the content that you are creating. You put those two together. Yeah, that's a very, I think, potent combination. I'll give an example. Let's say right now somebody wants to write a book and they go and they get a very large publisher. I happen to share with one of my books, your publisher. And they're top of the heap. Harper Collins is a big deal. And I've sold a lot of books working with Harper Collins. No cry for me, Argentina, no complaint. However, when time goes on, you start to say to yourself as a creator, well, hold on. Why are they buying that book? What's forcing them to buy that book over time? What's the audience drawn to? Is the audience drawn to the particular publisher? Is the audience drawn to the publisher's distribution? Or is the audience drawn to the creator in some way? They start following them on Twitter. They listen to their podcast, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the part. You can feel it in me. I can smell where this is going. I've got friends that I debate this with friends and like, oh, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. And I don't know half the detail that you know, Edward, but I can smell where this is going. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. And I think your approach to trend following, I think you'd be quite adept at NFTs. I think that it's a world that changes overnight. There's not a dull moment in the NFT market. Even today, there's just crazy stuff happening today. But it doesn't have to be necessarily exciting because at least from my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if Rick Rubin produces for some band or Mike Covell writes a new book or Edward Lee writes a new book, okay, that doesn't necessarily have to be exciting. But the exciting part personally would be, ooh, the ownership change and the potential distribution change. That's what becomes exciting. Oh, yeah. And I think we've only scratched the surface with different business models, different approaches to how to use NFTs to engage one's fans or engage one's patrons. I think recently, for instance, we've seen successful uses of open editions where you sell a bunch of NFTs for very low prices that generates this buzz or virality to the NFT and then what some creators are doing is coupling that with what's called a burning mechanism where you can trade in your NFT for different perks or different NFT that will then reduce the supply of the original open edition, which then potentially can either increase its value or at least preserve its value because we now made it more scarce. So those are the kind of things that creators are starting to play with more. In the past, I would say 2021, it was a year of, for the collections at least, launching a collection of, let's say, 10,000 NFTs, 
roughly, could be lower than that, but that was a very typical amount. The CryptoPunks, probably the Mona Lisas of NFTs, they set the playbook for that. 10,000 NFTs, and that's it. But now we're seeing different ways to use NFTs in a engagement with the patrons. It doesn't have to be simply you sell it once and that's it. It could be this mechanism where you get a lot of buyers into it, potentially keep preserve the value through this burning process to try to add on a different addition, let's say. Let me make up an example to try and clarify that for the audience. Let's say I create something and that something happens to be a hundred page digitally illustrated or just illustrated book showing some really interesting trading processes, trading rules. And I decide that I want to have a limited number of these, let's say 1,000. But it's a really cool piece of work. Let's say I put lots of time and effort into it, great illustrations, very unique. And for my audience, let's call it, even let me see if it's a niche audience, will really love something like this. But you put a limited number on it. So, okay, there's just maybe if I get lucky, maybe there'll be this intense demand. And okay, maybe the price sets itself. And then those 1,000 are gone, they're sold. But there's a way with NFTs where you can build in the aftermarket. And I think that's what you're hinting at a little bit is that I could structure that NFT from the moment that I launch it on this special product that, okay, I'll allow those 1,000 people to resell it if they want. They want to go put it on eBay or whatever and try to resell it. But when they resell it, I want a little more of that compensation. They're not going to get 100% back. That's not what the guarantee was from the beginning. But as a creator, I could develop the NFT to where I'm benefiting as my limited supply of this one particular product go out into the ether. What you're describing is very popular with authors and artists. Creator royalties built into the sale of the NFT. There's a current controversy over marketplaces getting around this, but let's put that aside for the moment. The notion of a creator royalty is something that was long recognized in France starting in the 1920s. Unfortunately, the United States Congress has not formally recognized what's called a resale royalty or copyright law, but the Copyright Office in 2013 supported the idea in the United States, including possibly voluntary agreements among parties, which is exactly what's happening today with creator royalties. To go back to your example, as a part of the sale of your NFTs for your book, you can include a royalty amount. Let's say the median amount is about 5% of the sale of the NFT. So as it is resold for however much, you would get 5% of that resale. To go back to what you said before, where's the value coming from when a book does well or when a piece of art does well? Largely, it is driven by the author or artist's reputation, content, artistry, you name it. We have to give a lot of credit to the creator who came up with whatever the underlying work is. And I think one thing that my book tries to do is to point out how historically we have devalued artists' work. And I'm not the only one who says this, but I tried to marshal the... When you say we have devalued, you mean big middlemen, big publishers, et cetera? I'm speaking more in general in terms of society. I'm a copyright law professor, so I'm speaking as somebody who is thinking about how our copyright system has been structured. Part of the problem is what you just described, is that really over time, our copyright system has been tilted to serve the middlemen or the distributors, the big media industries, which makes a lot of sense. I think economically, they contribute to the GDP of the United States. But at the same time, we have in the United States a copyright clause in the Constitution, which gives Congress the power to promote progress by guaranteeing an exclusive right to authors, to their respective writing, to authors. It doesn't say to industries or it doesn't say distributors, it says to authors. And I think 
that aspect of the copyright clause and trying to promote progress is something that our copyright system is not doing well today. I'll share something interesting, an observation. I think most people know this, but if I look at YouTube and I see that if you put a video up on YouTube and it has five seconds of an ACDC song, you're going to be taken down, you're going to be struck down. And so there's a real protection. YouTube's algos have decided that we will protect all the owners of this music, large companies, et cetera. But when it comes to something like a podcast or a book, my stuff can be pushed out there left and right. And only recently, for example, there was a great website out there. I would go there to check things, even if my own books were on there, which they were, this massive website that listed millions and millions of books for free. The FBI finally shut it down. But amazing for years, you have YouTube, you can't put five seconds of ACDC up, but for years and years and years, this website existed where you could download just about any book in the world for free. And it wasn't shut down until recently. So it's interesting where the attention goes to enforce copyright law. For YouTube, that is a byproduct of a lawsuit that Viacom brought against YouTube, that YouTube largely prevailed in that case. But in the aftermath, they struck a lot of licensing deals with music publishers, for instance, music labels, et cetera, to avoid threat of a lawsuit in the future. So YouTube built all their traffic with illegal music. Then they've got all this traffic. Then the big publishers come in and say, hey, 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 that's not going to work. And then they basically strike a deal to where YouTube shares that monetized traffic with the publishers to keep everybody happy, even though it was all built off originally sharing copyrighted material. Well, there were what appeared to be incriminating emails that came up during that case of ICOM among the YouTube co-founders. But ultimately, the court found that most of their activity that was alleged in the case fell within the DMCA safe harbor of notice and takedown. If they received a notice of infringement, they removed the videos. So by and large, YouTube prevailed in their defense. If you upload a video to YouTube, it's checking you right then and there before it even gets live. Exactly. They're using filtering. And they also have this elaborate process called content ID, which also caters to the industries. If they find something that is potentially a match in their filtering of potentially infringing content, they send a notice to the copyright owner and let the copyright owner decide what to do about it. I think the majority actually, if I'm not mistaken, decide to run ads on the allegedly infringing video. They make money off the suspected infringing video and just let it remain up. A lot of people turned off the idea of NFTs and blockchain once this guy down in the Bahamas, Bankman Freed, appeared to be a greasy actor on the scene. That really did not help with the average person's view of what NFTs were or are. For me, it didn't really shake me. I realized that these kinds of moments will delay acceptance or whatnot because that captures all the headlines and you get some bad actors involved. And that's why I was also curious to speak with you is just to see that this revolution has not stopped. Perhaps things can get delayed here and there, but the revolution forward has not stopped. I think with FTX and Sam Bankman Freed, it was a bigger hit to the cryptocurrency market, at least the fallout related to the earlier implosion of Terra Luna from the Do Kwon in South Korea. The SEC just filed a case against him. So this is what's called a cryptocurrency contagion in which when highly leveraged assets or cryptocurrency undercuts itself, then it produces this run on the cryptocurrency, resulting in it to go to near zero in value. That had a ripple effect with other DeFi companies that had to file for bankruptcy. So yes, that definitely has produced more skepticism of cryptocurrency. I would say that NFTs are different from cryptocurrency, even though often to buy NFTs, you need some cryptocurrency, at least in many marketplaces. Some marketplaces, you can use a credit card to buy an NFT. So 
that's fine. That would be the choice of most people today. I think most people today probably, unless they're diehard Bitcoin holders at this moment in time, would prefer nothing to do with cryptocurrencies to exchange their money or to store value. There are some startups that enable this. Dapper Labs on the Flow Network, which started the NBA Top Shot NFTs. Dapper Labs, their system allows people to use a credit card to charge things on Flow. Add one more point to why I think NFTs should not be viewed in the same boat as cryptocurrency, if there are any skeptics of cryptocurrency. I think the big businesses understand, as you have already pointed out earlier in this discussion, the utility of NFTs for virtual ownership and how it can enable a lot of creative work. Bob Iger, who just returned to Disney, recently just spoke about NFTs and he sees them as potentially the next generation of storytelling for Disney. This incredible way where it can be used for virtual ownership. Starbucks has used NFTs for its loyalty program and also just recently launched a set of NFTs that have done quite well. I know this is somewhat different from the independent creator, independent artist use of NFTs, but I think when big businesses see utility in this technology, that should provide some comfort to the public, especially people who are skeptics, that this is somehow a nefarious scheme that people are trying to pull the wool over somebody's eyes, this is actually real when it's not. What we're seeing is that many big businesses, as well as individual creators, are developing ways to use NFTs for our increasingly virtual world. I think that's a very key societal development with the increased virtual nature of our interactions as we are of doing right now, that makes the NFT so useful. I got to tell you, though, if I look at the example of Starbucks and Disney on one side and an individual creator either making music or a book on the other side, they're not in the same world. And Bob Iger at Disney doesn't want to do anything except own everything. He doesn't care one iota about the individual creator. He wants that brand, his company, to own everything. That's their job. That's what they do for shareholders. Own everything, make as much money as possible, make the share price go up. That's their job. On the flip side, though, what's really interesting is the entire operation of Disney is built on characters created by creators who you got to wonder if it was to play forward from this moment in time. Would Disney have ever had or built up the power that it does have? Would Stan over there in Marvel, he had the ability, not but just a few years ago, and he could have been the one that broke the bank. Could he have gone straight to his Patreons, his people? Could he have gone straight to Comic-Con and avoided Disney? That's why he went to Disney, to get the money to make the movies. He couldn't do it by himself. This is an interesting conundrum from my perspective. It's the creators on one side, it's the big operations on the other side, and I don't know if there will ever be a happy medium. I mean, look at David Geffen. The only reason David Geffen is rich is because he was smart enough to put Linda Ronsett, Jackson Brown, the Eagles, and Fleetwood Mac under contract in the 70s, and they're all poor bands today, and he made a billion plus. I mean, this is how the world works. That's a 20th century model. It's encapsulated by the term all rights reserved. It's a no trespassing for media or copyrighted content. Now, what's happening with the so-called Web3 startup companies and the more innovative creators using NFTs is that they're far more permissive in allowing the owners of NFTs to commercialize them. So I've done a study of the top 25 NFT projects. The majority of those projects are granting commercial rights to use the artwork associated with the NFT, including in making a derivative work or derivative works. 
So that would mean if we were using the example of Disney, they are enabling the owner of the NFT to commercialize, let's say, Mickey Mouse, including in a derivative work. And we're seeing that, for instance, not necessarily a movie, but we're seeing what I characterize as decentralized collaboration, most prominently with the most successful NFT project to date, which is the Board Ape Yacht Club. We're seeing numerous owners of their NFTs develop businesses, merchandise, restaurants, food, wine, et cetera, based on the artwork that is associated with our NFT. This is something that I characterize as 21st century collaboration. And we'll have to see. I, so early, that's the one thing that we have to remind ourselves, since the boom was 2021, we're really only two and a half years into this. And any transformation as great as this takes time. I think the last thing that we can point to is the dot-coms and dot-com businesses. Dot-coms, there was a bubble that burst, but now the idea of having an internet business is just taken for granted. Who's going to question whether having an Amazon is a viable business today or let's say a pet supply company on the internet? But on the flip side, the creators, the people that make the products that are sold on the middleman called Amazon, none of those creators, none of those manufacturers really want an Amazon to exist. It just happens to exist. They would all prefer to sell directly to their fans, so to speak. Yeah, and that's the benefit of having the scale of Amazon so you reach the masses, so to speak. I bring that example up, though, because it seems like if I just look at the NFT world, I'm sitting here looking at the subtitle of your book. If I think about the NFT world, even though you bring up the correct example of, okay, the dot-com era happened, but it took a long time to get traction, and then we got something like Amazon. But I look at the NFT world and I say, God, if this ever does break, the way that I can have a gut level feel, the way that I can imagine, this would just enable average people all around the world to reach audiences in such a way that maybe some of these big monoliths, look, okay, it's always going to be a great business for Amazon. We don't all want to have huge warehouses to ship stuff. I get it. So there's a value add there. But the idea that average people, average creators, or even exceptional creators could potentially, and I think that's what this conversation is all about, taking control, man, that's exciting as hell. To me, that wakes me up here early in the morning. That wakes me up later there for you in Chicago. But that wakes me up, the thought of that can happen. And I'm sure it does for you too. You would not have written this book if it did not excite you. Oh, entirely. And I think the artists who really started driving NFTs early on, it is so incredible to see how this has changed their lives. There's a chapter in my book titled Life Changing. For many, this new technology has enabled them to support themselves as artists when they never had a chance before. You're exactly right. This is exciting. This is the possibility. If we think about civilization, society, what makes a civilization great in terms of its arts, education, and we often think about the Italian Renaissance notwithstanding you know, their flaws, but that period of time when there was the production of great art and great creative works, I think is considered to be a paragon of artistic activity. And we could point to other periods too, but that's something that I think we need to have a conversation about in the 21st century. We don't. There's a lot of things to be concerned about, but also I think we need to start thinking about, well, how can we improve things for society. And one point that I make in the book is that there are numerous studies that show the benefits of art to society in terms of wellness, for instance, just simply that, go to wellness, uh, mental health. That is something that if we took seriously, we would start more aggressively trying to cultivate artists. How many more artists out there would be incentivized to really go for it if they felt like they could taste some of the economic benefit quicker? 
maybe if you're lucky, some publisher would give an author a little bit of an advance. You still got to pay it back. If a creator can put something out into the ether, and I've experienced this many times, so I'm motivated, I see it, I understand it deep in my bones. But if a creator can put something out in the ether and they can get a response in form of money coming in, that bond, that connection is gold. And I think there's so many more people out there that if they were trained, and the school system does a terrible job of this as well too. The school system doesn't teach people how to be creators. The school system teaches people how to memorize whatever. But if people could get that feeling, that sense of, oh, I made this, whatever it is, and then your fans or whoever, even if it's $1, $1 coming in could motivate that next artist to say, oh my gosh, I'm going to dedicate my life to this. I'm going to pursue my art. I'm going to do what I want to do. There's a lot of pieces to the success of NFTs. And look, there might be some people listening and they might be thinking, oh, Mike, you're, you're lost in la-la land. No, I don't think so. It's more to your point, which is we're in the early stages. I want us to be in the later stages. We're not in the later stages yet. We're going to get there. We're just not there yet. Just one example in terms of this ability to earn a living from your creativity. Now we're in this creator economy where it's primarily on social media where people are creating videos or photographs, TikToks, and trying to amass a huge following. But it is challenging because the algorithms change. They're just content for the game. They're content for the owners of TikTok. Exactly. But just imagine if you instead had a platform where gaining a million views would also allow the potential sale of NFTs related to that video. Let's say the video would potentially qualify, whether it's ad revenue or if it's simply coming through the NFTs. But that would be, I think, a fairer system than currently when you could potentially make a viral video and get nothing. You have helped the internet platform with all of these eyeballs, but the amount of ad sharing revenue that you might get is relatively low versus having something more direct in an open edition NFT where potentially many people who watch that video could buy into your channel, so to speak. That is the more, I think, fair system because the content creators are what attract the eyeballs, but it ends up being the internet platforms enjoy most of the revenues. This is why Mr. Bezos and Mr. Zuckerberg and the Google guys, they're all some of the richest people in the world because they basically took all the work of everyone. And I think if we all had it to do over again, we would have taken the same steps they did if we were in their position. Why not? If I was of Mark Zuckerberg's age and I was presented that opportunity, I would have gone down the same path. Most people would have. Why not? Now, if he gets later on his business and makes decisions that people don't like, yes, I get that. But the basics of how those companies came into existence, I'm not criticizing. I'm just making the case that I want to see them eventually not have that power. And I want to see the individual person get the potential income. And you do a great job of making that point. The book, Creators Take Control, How NFTs Revolutionize Art, Business, and Entertainment. Edward, we have just wet the whistle, so to speak, for people. They're going to have to dive into the book. You're a law professor, so they can imagine that I've only taken you around some basic issues. But for the deep dive, people are going to have to check out the book. Is there a place you might want to send people? The book will be on Amazon, all that fun stuff. But is there a website you might want to send people to? Sure. Thanks, Michael. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. This conversation has flown by and I could continue on with it, with all these fascinating issues to talk about. But if you want to check out my website, creatorstakecontrol.com, that'll provide you links to various websites and bookstores where you can grab or pre-order the copy, which comes out on March 28th. That's creatorstakecontrol.com. Edward, I appreciate you taking some time today. Please keep me posted on future work. Obviously, you can tell from my enthusiasm, I like this topic and I want to keep knowing more about this topic and I want to see the NFTs win out in the long run. So I appreciate you taking some time today. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been my pleasure. I see a time when those awake 
will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.